you to read, please, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Okay. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties, prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, in order that we may have that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life <clears throat> in all godliness and dignity. This is the good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the test the testimony born at the proper time. And for this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. All right, thank you. As we look at this section, we, um, we looked at verse 1 last week in which the, the Apostle Paul talks about four different kinds of prayer and uh, even though the translators have chosen some different words, each one of these words conveys a different aspect uh, of prayer. And so we talked about entreaties, prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving that would be a part of our prayer. But Paul also says that these should be made on behalf of all men. Uh so we should be praying, not just for ourselves, but we should be praying for everybody, all men. And uh, the word for men there is not a word that just means males, it means mankind. So we pray for all people, uh, acquaintances, people in power, people uh, in government, because that's where he goes in verse 2, that we should pray <coughs> for kings. All right, go to the most powerful uh, person in that particular nation, and Christians ought to be praying for that person. And all who are in authority. <clears throat> all right, so we go from the authority of the king on down to, uh, in our government, we would talk about congressmen. We pray for uh, our senators, we pray for our governors. Uh, on a state level, <clears throat> and then also mentioned last week, we have other authorities in our uh, civil setup when you talk about the, the police force and so on. <clears throat> there are people from the president on down that exercise authority over us. And here's the point. All of these impact the way that we live our lives. Now, if they conduct their business in one way, then it enables us to live our lives in a way that is going to be uh, where we can practice our Christianity without any uh, external problems. If they conducted their business in another way, that is where they are um, uh, interfering and they're making laws, for example, that would forbid the uh, uh, assembling of ourselves together, <clears throat> then we got a problem. And the problem is that we can't lead, and these are Paul's two words, a tranquil and a quiet life. Now, <clears throat> a tranquil life is the idea of a life that uh, it is pretty, pretty mellow. It is a life that uh, you're not afraid of somebody busting into your house. You're not afraid of somebody busting into the, the church assembly. There's a level of tranquility. Uh, when we think of uh, a lake, and it's described as a, a tranquil lake, well, it's not one that has these huge waves and, and uh, the winds are blowing and so on, but it's just nice and smooth. And that's the idea that Paul is describing here. We want to have a life <clears throat> that is smooth, where we don't have people i.e. government officials, that are making it very rough for us to navigate through life, and more specifically to navigate through our Christian life. 
And then the second word that he uses is that we want to lead a quiet life. All right? The word quiet is a word that has the idea of uh, we're not crying out because of oppression. Uh, we're not uh, constantly uh, expressing discontent for uh, the way that we're being treated. But uh, if you're quiet, then <clears throat> there's a level of peace. You're not uh, feeling like your, your life is being uh, disrupted. This is not a word that means without sound. Uh, it is the same word that we're going to look at later on in a few verses where he's talking about that uh, women need to learn uh, uh, with quietness. It's the same Greek word that we're going to see both in verse 12 and in uh, verse 11. <clears throat> Let a woman quietly receive instruction. So we'll talk some more about that word, but that is the word uh, that he's using here. But here's the real key. If you look at verse 2, we lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Now we've mentioned that godliness is one of the key words in 1 Timothy. And here Paul is showing us why this is such an important word. We want to be able to live godly lives. And it is easier to live a godly life when <clears throat> those authorities over us are not making our life <clears throat> very miserable. Now, on the one hand, people say <clears throat> from church history that Christians actually were stronger and better because of persecution. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a sense to that. I'm not denying <clears throat> the truthfulness of that. But Paul would not say that that's the optimum environment that we want to, to live in. Christianity can do some of its best work when uh, we're not having to worry about government oppression. And we are able to have that tranquility and that quietness and pursue godliness without external threats. And that's really the idea that he's trying to convey here. So uh, we want to have that, that godliness. We want to have that dignity. And uh, here is the idea of uh, with seriousness. And we're able to devote our complete total attention upon the affairs of God and the church and what the church should be doing, how the church should be evangelizing, how we should be living our lives. We're very focused upon our godliness. Now remember that we actually have a verse in 1 Timothy that defines what godliness is, and that's 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5. Love from a pure heart, a sincere faith, and a good conscience. And those are three elements of a godly person. And so we pray for people so that the, the lives around us will enable us to have that kind of love, that kind of conscience, uh, that kind of heart that uh, is a part of being godly. He says in verse 3, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. All right, this is what God wants. And we're all about pleasing God. And so uh, when we pray for men, God likes it. Now, if we think about the context of when this book was written, uh, we guesstimated that the book was written probably around 62 to 63 A.D. <clears throat> all right, well, that would be uh, during the time that some of the worst Caesars that ever sat on the throne uh, in Rome were occupying that position, like Nero. And, and so a Christian might think in his mind, God really doesn't want me to pray for a guy like that. He's as wicked and as evil and as despicable as they come. And so uh, I, I shouldn't pray for them. Or they might say, our local officials are as corrupt as can be. Our police force... Uh, they're nothing but a bunch of crooks. And why should we pray for them? God doesn't want me to pray for them. And he's saying, no, actually, you're exactly wrong. God does want you to pray for them. It's the good thing to do. And uh, <clears throat> when he uses the word good, 
He uses the word that uh, is not morally good, but the idea of it's just the right thing to do. It is uh, the best thing to do for a child of God to be praying for all people. And then secondly, he says it is acceptable. All right, that tells us that this is something that God is going to receive. When we do it, we have a God that, that is, uh, is quite open to it and encourages us, and he hears and accepts those prayers when we're praying uh, for others. And the insinuation here is that uh, it actually does some good. We're praying God likes it. God hears it. And so uh, it's going to accomplish what it is that we would like to accomplish. Now you can go to passages like the second chapter of Daniel or the 13th chapter of Romans. And uh, in those passages it talks about that the governments are those that are under the authority of God. God sets them up. God removes them. And uh, so, if we're with an abusive government, or maybe our local officials are those that uh, are uh, into persecuting Christians, well, our prayers can activate God where he's going to do something about that. And he's going to help the situation improve. So, you know what? There's a little mini lesson in this, and that is uh, just how powerful do you think prayers are? Do you believe that prayers can influence the policies of Barack Obama? Do you think prayer can influence the policies of state governments uh, the way we said? Well, you should, because if you don't, then uh, all of what Paul's saying here doesn't make any sense. Uh, he's saying, well... Pray for these guys. It's not going to do any good, but pray for them. Well, why would you say that? You wouldn't. doesn't make any sense. So it's good in God's eyes. It's acceptable in God's eyes. <clears throat> and then he says in verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Back years ago when I was preaching in Mississippi, uh, we had a marquee out front, and the men liked to put my sermon title on the marquee for the upcoming Sunday, hoping that maybe somebody would drive by and say, well, I think I'll stop by and see what the preacher's talking about there. So I tried to come up with creative sermon titles, and uh, that was admittedly not a strong <laughs> suit of mine. But I had one sermon that I entitled, Does God Always Get What He Wants? Does God Always Get What He Wants? Well, there were uh, some people that said, um, you know, I'm uh, not particularly uh, curious about that title because I already know the answer. And I said, what's the answer? He said, yeah, He does. He's all-powerful. If someone is all-powerful, then He gets what He wants. And uh, so I preached the sermon, and it was based on 1 Timothy 2.4, God desires all men to be saved. Well, are all men saved? No, they're not. So God doesn't get what he, always get what he wants. He wants all men to be saved. But because God has set up the world and set up humanity as free moral agents, uh, we can choose. He wants us to be saved. But he's not going to force us to be saved. He's not going to treat us like puppets and make us do something that we don't choose to do on our own. All right, so uh, he desires all men to be saved. This is why uh, he sent Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3.16. Uh, so we, we know that that's the will of God. Second Peter 3 and verse 9, God is patient toward you, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All right, so that's the way uh, God is. And God has done his part to make it possible. But this verse is telling us very clearly, this is what God wants. 
He wants all men uh, to be saved. Now this passage provides an obvious difficulty to uh, the Calvinist position. They have a doctrine. The doctrine is called limited atonement. <clears throat> Basically, that God foreordained or predetermined the eternal state of every person, man or woman. And that he predetermined whether they were going to be saved or whether they were going to be lost. Well, if that's true, then how do you explain this verse that says that God <coughs> desires all men to be saved? If he desires all men to be saved, then why would he predestine some for eternal damnation? It doesn't sound like he desires all men to be saved if he's doing that. Uh, so this one particular verse certainly provides uh, some difficulty for the doctrine of Calvinism and specifically the doctrine of limited atonement. Uh, also, their doctrine of what's called irresistible grace. Uh, if that doctrine were true and God wants all men to be saved, then he would send his grace to all men and they couldn't resist it even if they wanted to. So now you've got the idea of universal salvation. Everybody is going to be saved. If God desires all men to be saved, then all men would be a recipient of God's grace, and so then you've got universal salvation. But the fact of the matter is, uh, Jesus teaches us that uh, the way to uh, destruction is broad, and many are they that enter therein. They're going through the wide gate. So that's, um, uh, that's the sad truth of it, is that a majority of men are not choosing to do what God wants, but he wants all men to be saved. <clears throat> all right, then secondly, verse 4 says that God wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth. Truth is one of the key ideas in 1 Timothy as well as in 2 Timothy and Titus because without truth, men cannot have salvation. Truth is the key that leads someone from being lost to being saved. It's what tells you what you need to do. It's what shows you, explains to you what it is that God expects. Without truth, men waver away from the will of God. Without truth, men start practicing things that are outside the bounds of what God approves of. Uh, without truth, men wander away from godliness. And so it's important uh, to God that people come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, I don't know if, if you hear uh, much about what's called the emerging church uh, out there in Kentucky. We hear a little bit about it in Colorado. Uh, but those that are leading this particular movement uh, are saying that truth is not knowable. Now, that's not a new doctrine. There have been men that have been saying that uh, for centuries, and if you claim to have truth or if you claim to know truth, then there's a certain level of arrogance that you are uh, uh, conveying by that. Well, again, what are you going to do with 1 Timothy 2, 4 that says that God desires all men to come to a knowledge of the truth? Well, if this is what God wants, then it certainly is a possibility. Uh, Jesus said, uh, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8 and verse 32. Yeah, Chris. Hey, I reckon that God ain't going to want something that he ain't going to provide to have it happen. Yeah. That's uh, that would be ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, God wants men to come to a knowledge of the truth, but God says, of course, they're not going to be able to do it, but I, I still want them to. Well, no. You know, he says the truth is out there. He's put truth out there uh, for men to know. And so uh, it certainly is possible uh, for us to know the truth. And that leads us to another thought, and that is if truth is knowable, then we are held responsible for knowing it. God's put it out there. He's given it to us. Uh, Paul would say in Ephesians 5 and verse 17, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is so we can know what truth is. Uh, so what is the truth about instruments in worship? 
What is the truth about women preachers? What is the truth about the necessity of baptism or the uniqueness of the church or abortion or homosexuality or whatever topics that you want to discuss? Well, God has given us the truth. And he wants all men to know uh, what is truth. Now, there are some that have suggested that Paul kind of got his order mixed up. Uh, because don't you have knowledge first and then salvation second? Uh, you got salvation first and knowledge second. Uh, so, you know, isn't Paul a little confused there? Well, I believe there are at least two reasons why he has it in this order. And the first one is that, uh, like in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, it talks about making disciples, you baptize them, and then you teach them to observe all things that I commanded you. You say, well, you've got baptism first and then teaching second. Isn't that the, don't you teach someone first, and then after you teach them, they uh, uh, then choose to be baptized? Well, there's an assumption that there is a level of teaching done before someone is baptized. What Jesus is emphasizing is what happens from the point that a person is baptized on from then. Uh, you have to teach them, mentor them, bring them along in their Christian walk. Uh, well, that's the idea that uh, Paul has here. You know, men are saved, but after that salvation... They continue to grow in truth, understanding truth, knowing how truth functions and what, uh, how truth is to be applied in the various aspects of their life. So it's not suggesting that they're not going to know truth before they're saved. Uh, that's ridiculous. But after they're saved, then they're going to learn uh, more about truth. But there's another reason, I think, why Paul has it in this order and that is because he wants to talk about truth. In the next several verses, I believe he's actually going to describe what is the truth that he wants men to know. And when you look at verse 5, down through verse 7, we have what I believe to be a very important list of, all right, God wants all men to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, in your Bibles, uh, do you have the word for that begins verse 5? Right. All right. So it says, for there is one God. All right, he wants all men to come to a knowledge of the truth. For, all right, that's connecting the thought with verse 4. And he's going to explain to us the truths that God wants all men to know. First of all, God wants all men to know there's only one God. There's only one God. Many, many ancient cultures as well as modern cultures are polytheistic. I've done a lot of traveling in Africa. I've been traveling in Cambodia, traveling in uh, parts of Europe. And there are still major world religions that are polytheistic. Well, one of the truths that God wants all men to know is there's only one God. And uh, <clears throat> they need to know that there is only one God. Well, we also could say, well, uh, Islam only believes in one God, but the God they believe in is not the God of the Bible. There's only one God. Uh, and that's the God of the Bible, the God that created the universe. And so when he wants all men to come to a knowledge of the truth, the knowledge he wants them to know, first of all, there's only one God. <clears throat> Second of all, he wants all men to know that there is only one mediator between God and men. A mediator is one that stands between two parties and equally represents both parties. An intercessor is one that basically is uh, operating on the, on the behalf of one working as a spokesman, but mediation is bringing two people together. And so Jesus recognizes that there is a separation between God and men. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Your sin has separated you. 
from you and your God and has hid his face from you. <clears throat> uh, James would say in James chapter 4 that do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? All right, so uh, we have a problem. And our problem is sin, and our sin has separated us from God. And Jesus now is the one mediator between us and God. <clears throat> All right? So this would eliminate any and every other kind of mediator. Uh, some religions look to Mary as a mediator. They pray to Mary as the mother of God and call upon her to represent their needs before uh, Jesus. So <clears throat> the idea is, boy, the best way to get a man to, to do what you want him to do is, is go talk to his mother. His mother will get him to, to do what you want. So go talk to Mary, <clears throat> and Mary will get it uh, straightened out. Or uh, in Catholicism, they will uh, make an appeal to... Um, what they call saints or patron saints. Uh, these are supposedly people that had died that would have a very good standing with God. And now that they're dead, uh, they have the sole purpose of serving uh, God's children in the here and now. And, and they will take your case and bring it before uh, God the Father. Well, <clears throat> one of the truths that God wants all men to know, there's only one medium. And that's all. Uh, Mary's not going to work. Uh, dead saints aren't going to work. Uh, there are no other mediators. So if you want access to God, then there's only one that's going to get you access. This goes along with John 14 and verse 6 where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. <clears throat> all right, so he's our only, our only mediator. All right, that automatically, all by itself, is going to eliminate the Quran. It's going to eliminate uh, any other religious book outside of the New Testament. The New Testament is the one and only book that introduces Jesus, tells us how we become uh, um, saved by Jesus, and how Jesus then functions as the mediator for those who are God's children. All right, the, um, uh, the last part of verse 5 says, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, there have been some that have, have tried to uh, build an argument that here the resurrected Christ is still a man. Uh, because, you know, if this was written in 63 and Jesus died and was resurrected in 33, <clears throat> then why 30 years later is Paul still calling Jesus a man if he's no longer a man? Well, this particular line of reasoning is way out of bounds of what Paul is trying to, to deal with here. What he's trying to establish is the idea that the one that mediates for you is the one that lived as a man. He was a man. He knows what it's like to be a man. Just like the Hebrew writer would say that he was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. So Jesus knows what it's like to be hot, to be tired, to be thirsty, to be hungry, to be tempted. And so when I'm looking for a mediator, I'm looking for someone that understands me, understands my life and what I go through and the kind of struggles I have. And he's saying... That's who is the mediator between you and God, uh, the man, Jesus Christ. Denny? Yeah. Is he less God, being that he is man God? Yeah, no, of course not. And that's okay. a good point. Uh, so he perfectly represents the side of divinity because he's God, and the side of humanity because he lived as man. <clears throat> and so... There's no one else. Muhammad's not going to do it. Uh, Joseph Smith's not going to do it. Buddha's not going to do it. Because none of them uh, have been on both sides of, uh, of this discussion, being both God and man, which is that which uh, 
describes Jesus. All right, other comments? What is frustrating, Jenny, is that in the public arena, this truth that is so sadly needed to support Christian morality is spoils. It is. And if it happens to, to come out in the open, it's, it's ridiculed. All right, there's the fourth truth that God wants all men to be to know. And our really uh, third truth, if you put the, uh, the man Christ Jesus with that uh, one mediator point, and that is he wants all men to know that Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. all right, when we talk about the truth that all men need to know, this is a primary point that Jesus gave himself as this ransom. The word ransom is a word that means to pay the price for. We understand that we have sinned against God and we uh, need someone to pay the price for the sin that we committed. Because Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. All right, so uh, who's going to pay those wages? Well, Jesus is going to pay the price. He's going to be our ransom. Now, this word is used only here and in uh, Matthew 20 and verse 28 and Mark 10 and verse 45, where Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, the fact that Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all gives a difficulty, again, to Calvinism. Because if Jesus gave himself a ransom for all, then why do not all have the benefit of uh, the salvation work of Christ? That's what the verse says. He gave himself for everybody. So, if that's true, then why would God predestine some <clears throat> to condemnation? He obviously didn't give himself for those because God already had those people locked in for condemnation. They think they do. They think they do, yeah. That's a, uh, another group of uh, kind of, I don't know, being deceived. He didn't just give himself for the elect, though. He gave himself for all people that would respond uh, to the gospel. It's wide open. Anybody, everybody <clears throat> could uh, obey the gospel and be saved. Jesus' blood is just that powerful that it could literally save 100% of all humanity. But uh, they're not taking advantage of the sacrifice of Christ. Alright, so God wants all men to know that they have a Savior. That they have someone that did something that is going to take care of their sin problem. And then the fourth truth that God wants all men to know <clears throat> is found in the phrase, the testimony born at the proper time. All right, he wants all men to, be, to know that the plan of salvation through the work of Christ wasn't an afterthought, wasn't an accident, wasn't something that God just came up with at the last minute, but this was something that was designed and planned before the foundation of the world. God knew what he was going to do, knew how he was going to do it, and it was a testimony that was born about at the proper time, just like in Galatians 4 and verse 4, uh, there Paul makes the point <clears throat> that at, at the proper time, came the work of Christ. Also, in Ephesians 3 and verse 10, Paul talks about the church and how the church was that which is a part of the <laughs> eternal purpose of God. So he wants all men to know that this wasn't something that was uh, an accident. It wasn't something that was thrown together at the last minute. But it actually was something that was thought through by God and was a part of his plan and he executed his plan at the proper time, at the exact 
best time in all of uh, the uh, uh, all of human history. Now, <clears throat> a lot of times we look at Galatians four and four and say, why was the the time that Jesus came? Why was that the proper time? You ever heard some explanations on that? Anybody? <clears throat> One time, I think it was even in this classroom, uh, I think it was uh, Dave Chamberlain says that at that time, Greek was the language spoken all throughout the world, and it was one of the ones that thoughts could be re, uh, represented in the most accurate way possible. So probably it was that situation of, of a universal language that <coughs> most of the world understood, and that language being one that could, as accurately as possible, describe what God wanted. Good. So Chris is actually bringing out two points under the umbrella of the, the fact that Greek was the universal language. One is everybody spoke it, so that enabled the gospel to be spread quickly by the fact that everybody spoke that one language. And second of all, as scholars have, have said for centuries now, there has never been a, a more precise language than Greek. Uh, you know, we talk about we've got one word for love. Well, the Greeks had four words uh, for love. Uh, we have one word for faith. Well, the Greeks had really, um, I think, six different words that are all translated into our word faith. <clears throat> There's a precision there uh, with the Greek language. So that was definitely one reason why it was the best time. Uh, how about some others? How about the prophecy of Daniel being fulfilled? Yeah. When you look at Daniel chapter 9 and the, and the prophecy of the 70 weeks, uh, he said exactly when uh, all of this was going to come. Uh, and so the rabbis had it figured out. They knew uh, when the prophecy. So they were looking for the Messiah. Look in Luke 2. Simeon uh, was looking for the Messiah. Well, uh, he probably was using the prophetic passages in Daniel. If our God had wanted him to be Jesus to come at a different point in history, he would probably have different prophecies. Well, it would have had to have, sure. like Daniel 9 would have to have uh, projected it, a different it was, it was something that was unique about the world, that that situation, you know, maybe the people who are alive before versus after, there was something unique about that point in history that God said this is what it's going to be. Well, and that's kind of what we're just brainstorming. The Bible doesn't really answer this question, but uh, what was it that was unique about that first century period of time? Also, like Greek was one. A world government that pretty much... All right, there's the second. Uh, you've got one government that rules all these nations. Uh, and that, that one government enabled uh, there to be a level of stability uh, as far as, um, you know, that... Uh, that first century world. And uh, I think it's probably one of the only times in human history that, you know, they, they talk about the Pax Romana, you know, that in all of human history there were like 150 peaceful years of human history, and most of, you know, 100 of them was during the Roman Empire right around that time. I, I read that someplace. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. God, the all knowing God, knew the proper time to bring Christ into the world. And he brought him in at that time. His knowledge, not anything the prophets knew. They couldn't pinpoint it to the time, the year, but God knew. Yeah. So proper time, he brought Christ into the world. Why do you think it was the proper time, though? I don't what know. What made it God the proper time? God do. Yeah, I know. I know God do. But if we try to figure out why in God's mind was that the proper time? Well, uh, we can speculate a whole lot on that. And yeah. Guess some, yeah. Make some good guesses on it. But. <laughs> well, one thing, Danny, is, is the government and society was about as corrupt and immoral at this period of time than has ever been in history. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, we, we, you mentioned Nero. Well, you've got a whole line of Roman rulers that are just morally corrupt. And, and the whole government, to a certain extent, is that way. 
And you read Paul's letter in Corinthians, and he's talking about some of these things, these people that used to, the way they used to be. That was a very common thing in, in the lives of this people, this, this total uh, way they degraded themselves. Yeah, and what's interesting about that is that some have suggested that because of the corruption of the Roman Caesars, that made it a most inopportune time for Christianity to try to uh, to establish itself because of all of the opposition. Both, if you think about it, Christianity, was being attacked from both sides. You had the Jews that hated them, and you had the Roman government that hated them, and so there wasn't anybody that liked Christians. And, uh, and they're trying to, to uh, establish themselves in that kind of environment. But God knew that they were going to be able to establish themselves and even flourish in that particular environment. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the men that was martyred said the blood of the saints is seed for the church. And uh, so it had a way of uh, making it, uh, the church grow. I think that sometimes when, when things get really, really bad, there are some people, good people, that are aching for the other way, God's way. And I think that sometimes when things get real bad, the people who are aching for it ache for it even more so. So maybe God knew. God knew that, that you know, that there were going to be a lot of people who were going to see what's going on in the world and say, there's got to be something else something besides... Else beside this, and then when it's presented to them, wow. Yeah. Well, anyway, yes, Karen? Um, Christ had to have a lineage that showed that he was from the tribe of Judah, that he was from David, and they certainly couldn't do that today. Um, and not much after he lived, they lost that. All those records destroyed, yeah. <clears throat> Well, I, you know, we're we're just making guesses, and and uh, um, all of the reasons that God had in mind are a lot more than we probably could ever think of. But there have been some that have said because you've got one central government, um, you had commerce, and uh, you have merchant ships that are flowing from country to country, and that enabled evangelists to hop on those boats and and bring the gospel to other places, and that was not true even going back a couple of hundred years or going a, hundred, a couple of hundred years forward. And some have said that the, the Roman government uh, established uh, good roads. And so uh, land travel was that which was better than it had ever been in all of the history of mankind. So, I don't know, there's a, a lot of different things. It's kind of interesting to think about it. <clears throat> but the point is that... Uh, God wants men to know that he thought this through and he knew exactly the right time to send Christ, exactly the right time uh, to bring this message of salvation uh, to mankind. <clears throat> now, uh, Paul says, and for this, this truth that God wants all men to know, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I Paul looked at his own life and he said, really, I have tried to get this truth out to people, packaging it in different ways. Sometimes I'm preaching this message that God wants all men to know. And then as an apostle, I'm trying to get this message out. And of course... One of the, uh, the jobs of, of a man like the Apostle Paul was to, to write the gospel down. I mean, here we are uh, 2,000 years later, and we're reading uh, the words of Paul that's teaching us about <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the salvation work of Christ. And then third, he says, as a teacher, all right, now uh, in, in formal settings where Paul had students that are willing to listen and learn and, and be educated about uh, <clears throat> the God's plan. I don't know if anybody has ever had uh, an experience similar to uh, mine, but I want to 
want to conclude with this story. When I, uh, well, in the middle 1980s, I went to uh, do some work in Central America, in Panama. And the, uh, the men that I was working with had, had already arranged that we were going to do some jungle evangelism. We were going to go off into these remote places in the jungles of Panama, and we were going to preach the gospel to the various tribal villages that we would come upon. Well, so we, got, we landed in Panama, and off we went, and <clears throat> going down these, uh, these paths that sometimes were narrow, heavily wooded on both sides, and, and then just suddenly you'd come upon a, upon a village, and uh, we would uh, find the tribal chief, and we would explain to him who we were, and ask his permission if we could talk to his villagers, and <clears throat> never once did any of the tribal chiefs say no. But this is what was interesting about that experience. It was the first time in my life that I had ever talked to people that had never heard the name Jesus before. You were starting from absolute scratch in trying to tell someone about uh really, the plan of salvation. Where do you begin? <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm thankful that prior to that trip, I had spent <coughs> considerable hours working in the text of 1 Timothy because I thought, these are the four points that God wants all men to know. So here I am, I'm talk, talking to these tribal villagers that have never heard the name Jesus. Where do you begin? I began by talking about there's only one God. Now, <clears throat> That got a, a reaction from them. They had never heard that before. All they had ever known of were lots of gods. You had the sun god and the moon god and the tree god and the animal gods and, <clears throat> and all that. And uh, some of the villagers had their little uh, idols and so on. And so you're establishing that, that there is just one God. And then you go from there and you talk about that there's one mediator between us and that one God. And uh, then why do we need a mediator? Well, we need a mediator because we're guilty of sin. That God has expectations on how we should live our lives. And if we violated those uh, expectations, those laws and commands, then uh, we're uh, no longer in a good relationship with him. And we need uh, someone to mediate for us. Well, that inter introduced Jesus. And so now you can talk about uh, who Jesus was. And you can tell the story of the incarnation and tell the story uh, of his preaching ministry and tell the story of the cross and the death, burial, and then the resurrection of Jesus. Well, and then uh, you could talk about why he had to go to the cross. What was the point of that? Well, because he needs to be the ransom for all. And I remember saying distinctively to these villagers, all means you. So even though until this day you had never heard of Jesus Christ, he gave himself, he died on a cross for you, for your sins. He, won, he paid the price for you. And uh, it was interesting to see the reaction when that particular truth was made known. And then, fourth, we talk about that this was all planned. It was born about at the proper time. That God had it all worked out. Well, fortunately, uh, look at this text and say, boom, 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 boom. You've got four things that God wants all men to know. And uh, so, teaching it to those uh, villagers in Panama. Very, very neat experience. And really, the first time uh, I had ever encountered someone that never heard the name of Jesus growing up in the United States. That just doesn't happen. But in other countries, there still are places where they don't know who you're talking about. All right. It is time for us to quit. Thank you very much for those of you at Broadway for uh, sitting in the class. Hope you have a good rest of this week, and we'll look forward to seeing you. Uh, actually, I'm glad that I said that because I'm going to be doing a gospel meeting in Coops, Texas next week, and so we will not have class, we will not have class next Wednesday night, so, alright, so we'll see you in two weeks.
Thank you, Davey. Thank you.